is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Zach Parnell with uh, Industrial Training International, Director of Business Development. Uh, we have Mike Parnell showing his screen right now. He's going to be our presenter today. And uh, Neil Cherry is also on the call. He's our Training Solutions Associate here on our, basically our account executive team. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's going to highlight a few questions that were asked probably in the preliminary uh, you know, uh, registration. But also we, we want to wait a couple minutes because a lot of times people have to download, go to webinar. It takes a few minutes to get in, so we'll be starting here shortly. But take it away, Mike. OK, well, thanks. And I appreciate everybody attending this morning. Uh, we're uh, continuing to uh, help expand the uh, knowledge of uh, folks around the world in a variety of ways. Uh, both from uh, uh, media content and training and consulting. And I say we, I say it's our whole industry. Uh, it seems like we're just making great inroads as an industry to uh, help get folks uh, dialed up on, on operating with best procedures and uh, good practices, both with cranes, rigging, and other uh, load handling equipment. The, uh, as just a quick intro, uh, ITI serves a variety of industries. I just noticed this morning uh, during the registration uh, uh, coming in and all the other uh, uh, activities uh, associated with this webinar, we have uh, uh, 16 uh, different countries being represented. I noticed uh, we have uh, folks from Argentina, Guatemala, Nigeria, Kuwait. So. Uh, we've got a, a great uh, overlay of the of the world here. We have uh, 32 states uh, represented, and we have some folks uh, from uh, Canada. We have three provinces in Canada that are uh, joining us this morning. So we're, we've got a uh, very uh, large cross section of the uh, of the world involved in this and you can see I think by just by that we have uh, a large interest in improving our crane and rigging operations around the world and in each each facility each location and each site and basically for all the employees that are involved in that so we're quite uh, pleased with the participation and look forward to uh, a great morning together here so thanks everybody for joining us and we look forward to uh, uh, entertaining some questions as time goes along here. We have uh, a number of uh, methods that we can communicate together, both by uh, polls and open questions. And in, uh, I noticed that also in the registration uh, for this, we have uh, folks from a variety of uh, industries. This is a large portion of uh, ITI's customer base. But uh, also uh, uh, we have some folks from um, we have Carl Johnson from BPs with, uh, with our P30 uh, lift planning group. That's a new ASME document for lift planning. And also Joe Kuzar with uh, Shockey Precast. I noticed uh, we've got Hank Dutton in from, uh, he's uh, with Travelers, uh, but he's on the NCCCO board. And Jeff Roach is on the CIC board. Uh, Bev Odell looks like she's here uh, with uh, representing some of the media folks. Uh, we just, uh, we've got some OSHA people online, uh, Fleur, uh, the Shaw Group, uh, New York State uh, DOT, uh, Mr. Crane, uh, Bragg, and uh, Crane, Mazzella. We've got a ton of folks here, and we are going to have a great, uh, great time in the uh, discussion. So some of the uh, things that we want to kind of keep on online with is in our agenda, we're, we're taking a look at uh, ways to help um, help improve uh, your experience. We, we'll discuss that in just a minute. But you'll see on the screen we've got um, a variety of things that we're going to really key in on, and that's five best practices uh, for overseeing your crane and rigging activities, and then how to manage simple and complex lifting and the people that conduct them, and some certainly answering or working with some questions on OSHA and ASME and qualification, certification, and some of the costs associated with either training, inspection, and maintenance, 
things like that. So, and we have set aside uh, significant time at the very end. This sometimes, I got to tell you, this sometimes is the best part of a program like this is the questions and answers when we can uh, start uh, uh, dealing with some some of the specifics. We did ask some folks to um, to send in some questions in advance, and that was on our sign up and. Um, You'll also be able to ask questions during the program, uh, type in questions. We've got a couple of people standing by that are going to help us field those questions and get them organized for us. And uh, we'll be working hard to try to respond to those either during the uh, live presentation or uh, during the uh, question and answer session at the very end. Uh, some of the items uh, within this quick tip um, is the interactive discussion that I just mentioned, but I do want us to all be thinking about the long-term elements that are uh, associated with a discussion like this today is because it directly affects your, your operation, your organization on things that you might be uh, looking at in, in expansion, consolidation, uh, for uh, joining di different groups together within your organization if, if there is a need for paring down and also preparing for tomorrow. I've noticed um, really exciting uh, news with about four customers in the last three months that have brought uh, jobs and work back from overseas uh, into the U.S. And it uh, seems like uh, we all looked, at, looked across the different uh, workforces and whatnot to be able to provide products for us. And uh, as a result of some challenging opportunities with uh, with uh, quality control and all kinds of other things uh, a lot of a number of manufacturers and organizations are bringing work back to their home uh, countries to able be able to produce those here and that just means to me that we're continuing to, are going to continue to grow and expand and invest in our operations and and in the doing of that we've got to stay competitive and be capable of responding quickly to what the economy and what the what the uh, world is demanding from a product base. You'll notice from time to time we'll have some uh, polls. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to ask Zach uh, and uh, Neil to, uh, we have a poll we'd like to pop up on the screen here uh, as a result of one of the questions uh, that, that came in. And um, let's see if we can get, get that going for you here. And just All so you right. know, everybody, to answer the poll, you just, um, on your control panel or up on the screen, you just, you'll be able to click the, one of these selections and then hit submit. Okay. All right. And it looks like uh, that poll is uh, good to go. And uh, just respond to that, and uh, Zach, we're back on with our uh, regular flow, right? It says, uh, what is your company's uh, mobile crane distance requirement for kind of weight to obstruction? And a number of you are going to click in and have clicked in. Um, this was a question uh, I think one of our friends from Moat Construction provided for us, and it had to do with... Um, the counterweight uh, to obstructions, if you look in the new 1926-1400 um, uh, document for construction cranes, they don't give a specific uh, footage uh, spacing. I would be curious, uh, anybody that wants to write in, uh, if you have local uh, jurisdictional uh, requirements, uh, Cal OSHA, uh, New Mexico, uh, West Virginia, where they have state plan states, and you have specific requirements according to a state plan state that gives a, a, a clearance of required three feet or four feet, I'd appreciate uh, letting us know that. But the big thing is to always quote uh, book, chapter, and verse. Where does that, where does that information come from? So uh, there, uh, most company policies insist on a four-foot clearance. I think we see that on a, a number of the crane tests and others that on the national accreditation testing process. Uh, but there is a, a clearance uh, recommended, and uh, we always uh, we we continue to run into a few cases each year where somebody gets crushed between a, ca a counterweight on a crane and a uh, truck 
frame and or counterweight and a column that may be behind the crane and we have uh, an issue uh, with somebody getting hurt or pinched or crushed. So uh, that was a question and I looked uh, pretty hard in ASME B30.5 in the 1400 document. Uh, I don't think it was stated in the 1926 uh, 550 in the old one uh, for construction cranes and I didn't see it in the uh, 1910.180 document OSHA for uh, cranes for general industry. So somebody's got a hard number that's actually in publication from OSHA or ASME, you know, send it in. We'll, we'll share it with everybody. We've got everybody's email. And, uh, but just again, please make sure that you quote where's the source and where's that coming from. Let's take a look then. Um, five best practices in overseeing your crane and rigging activities. And these are uh, our agenda items that we promised to discuss. And in, in the uh, number one position here is make a decision to commit to excellence. And, you know, as most of you can tell me back uh, from our friends around the, uh, around the world and around the industry, um, this really is almost a, uh, this decision really gets to be a mindset. Uh, it's not a, um, it's not so much uh, a budget item. Uh, that helps. But really the mindset and the uh, attitude of the management and all the way uh, from uh, upper management, the board, and through the uh, project superintendents or site facility managers, all the way to the person uh, the, in, in the warehouse. It, it is a decision that uh, needs to be made. Uh, um, and I think the one thing that i got to share with you is um, we have to really uh, practice what we preach. And there is nothing more important uh, than reinforcing to the employees the importance if we're going to preach proper methodology, proper usage of equipment, proper inspection, and proper operations of whatever the equipment is. Uh, and we find that we've got a crane that may be deficient, uh, maybe that it's got some uh, issues with it that are not fixable, uh, and you can't bypass, let's say, uh, uh, it may not be something as simple as the uh, LMI or uh, is out of whack today. Well, can we go ahead and operate the crane? There are provisions for doing that for, to go to a manual method. Uh, there, so the ones I'm really talking about are um, we have brake issues or we have swing and control issues. Um, it may be an overhead crane that has too much drift in the block. And when we lower, we just don't get uh, that warm, fuzzy feeling. It's stopping, you know, at command at will. It may drift down six or eight inches, and you know the brakes need adjusting and so on. That's when we really need to step in and practice what we preach. Stop that operation, tag that machine out, and get it get it properly um, repaired. And and it it is it's a reinforcement to the employees that we will support you. You support us, and we will make sure things happen in the right way. And if we're going to gloss over it, band-aid it, um, duct tape it, bailing wire, you know, it's just, it, it really destroys the entire approach to uh, proper methods and proper operation. It's hard to make demands and requests for employees when we're not providing the same practices ourselves in, in what we've said in a safety meeting or an instructional session or training program. We will do these things. And then when it really rubber meets the road, we don't do it it's shame on us. We need to continue to um, back that up with action. So, and that really starts at the top. If we don't have a buy-in from the top, uh, I tell you, it just doesn't work. We do a, a lot of crane and rigging audits uh, on site at uh, clients' facilities, and we review the uh, crane operations, mobiles and overheads. We review the rigging activities. But a whole different category uh, is the crane and rigging managers to support for those folks doing the work in the field. So, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that downstream. Uh, certainly it is, uh, the employees have an active participation. It is a bit of a mindset for them. Uh, they get to uh, go home walking and standing up at night uh, versus laying down on a stretcher. I mean, it's, it's they see the value, they see the, the need for uh, practicing uh, good rigging and load handling activities, and it is really a, um, it's there, it's, it's start, if we always start at home with their kids and their family, 
and their need and the reasons to be able to do the things in the right way, uh, it, it comes back to work and we can uh, help continue to improve or increase or uh, enhance that mindset that the employees buy into our practices, procedures, and proper methods. One thing I think that's uh, a huge element today, and we're seeing this because a lot of uh, folks have instead of maybe getting all their operators certified, uh, nationally accredited certified, especially in the construction events, uh, they may be using more subcontractors. And, subco and uh, contractors are going to, uh, uh, certainly as you bring them on site, we're going to be looking at their, um, their safety record, their recordables, and uh, how they're practicing their elements. I will share with you that we probably uh, investigate, uh, you know, I don't know, probably eight or ten accidents a year. We do a lot of uh, expert witness work, and I'd have to tell you that at least half of the accidents that we find on a site involve uh, two parties, at least contractors and site personnel, and therein lies the challenge. Uh, we get a lot of crossover and. Uh, you want to make sure that the person or the company that you're hiring to come in there, I know we've got machinery movers and crane service companies online with us today, and uh, the people that are online with us today are probably uh, all part of the solution because they are proactive in trying to maintain a high level of integrity and operation. Uh, they're, they're, they're dialed in, and I compliment them for their... Um, a proactive approach to seeking more information and becoming better so that when they go on site they are providing the very best service possible. So it's, it's some of the other folks that we you know typically have issues, um, contractors folks uh, do, do things and get a site employee hurt or vice versa potentially and so when we get two or three parties involved all of a sudden we've got a train wreck and uh, so from a management standpoint we want to make sure we're hiring the right people to come in to do the right jobs. We want to make sure that they're qualified, they got the right equipment. There's nothing wrong with them when they drive through the gate to look at their cranes, ask for inspection records, ask for qualifications uh, and competency levels. Uh, having uh, folks on site from their organization that are competent as either lift director, assembly disassembly director, those kinds of things, we've got to be asking those questions. Uh, and that's part of what this relationship between you and you and I are, is to, to determine and discover what some of those questions and what some of those inquiries should be about. Uh, let's take a look at the next frame here as uh, know your exposure. This is a uh, huge element and um, I was down at, uh, in California working at a, uh, a uh, fertilizer facility and uh, sulfuric acids and chlorine and all kinds of chemicals. That's not uncommon to a lot of work sites. Uh, we, we work um, in helping identify and differentiate between standard lifts and critical lifts for their activities. It was a, um, in, in any other site, uh, it might be considered critical lifts going over four inch sulfur, uh, sulfuric acid line. In their facility, it's done every single day of the week. And so we got down to some things like uh, if it's liquid and it falls to the ground, you know, that's a bad thing, but we can, can try to contain that. If it's a vapor or gas, where it's released in the air and we can affect the general public, okay, then at that point, a certain size line becomes a critical lift. So we look at exposure and look at risk and identify what's it going to, uh, where's it going to put us as a company, what image is it going to uh, knock on if we have an incident, what, what exposure is there to risk to the general public. Uh, we always know we have situations and conditions and risk levels within the organization for um, employees and our own ongoing activities, but we want to measure that risk and decide at what point uh, are we going to draw the line in the sand and say this is not a, a standard lift which may not require documentation. This will be into the critical lift category. We developed a little um, little thing called lift calculator, and I think this this has been a huge adder for a number of clients that have taken a look at this. And I'll pop that up on the screen. This lift calculator, uh, we've used this a lot of times to help get folks to identify the number of uh, activities they have going on on an annual basis. And so if you take a look, now this can be downloaded from our website, but if you take a look, uh, we put in um, 
a, a fabrication generation group up here um, in the top header, and then we we just took a, an inventory of their cranes, and then we started talking and working with their uh, maintenance people and some of their uh, activities and project people. And so we've got a you can see on the screen we've got a count here of uh, the number of mobile cranes is um, right here is five, and we've got um, an average number of lifts each day. Standard lifts per crane is 24, and then that translates into 31,000 lifts a year for standard lifts. We ask the same question then with um, number of cranes. Sorry about that. Number of cranes, um, again, is five, and then how many critical lifts uh, per month for each crane, and that transmits out here to 180. So you tabulate all those up. We have also the overhead crane category covered and the electric hoist in their shops, and certainly a lot more uh, standard lifts. Uh, in this case, they, they didn't make any electric hoist critical lifts. You can see that's zero over here. But I think some fascinating information is then gets produced down here at the bottom end. And that's really what, what drives me when we start talking with clients about, gee, we need to upgrade and improve our programs, our process, our methods, and so on. And um, out of uh, all the cranes on their property, they have 60 cranes here. They have uh, 790,000, almost 800,000 standard lifts in a year. That's a lot of lifts, uh, but not uncommon. Uh, we were down in, at a maritime conference in Mobile in December, and they were at 17 million lifts in the room of 40 companies. We, we add them all together. So it doesn't take much to get to three or 400,000 lifts in a facility in a year. But a, a little bit more surprising number is this uh, 408 uh, critical lifts. And that's, that's a high consequence uh, lift. I know we've got uh, Joe Kuzar and uh, Carl Johnson from the P30, uh, ASME P30 lift planning group with me that we work together on the same committee. And the, these are categories that by definition within the organization, uh, they've decided these category, this category trips them over into required uh, for their site, required for uh, written plans, uh, lift director uh, active involvement, uh, in, and, and so we start walking down the steps, and I'll show you those in just a few minutes. The um, process is, gets to be uh, cranked up a little bit more. It's really about accountability, tracking, um, a little bit more formalization of the process, a lot more check boxes to be filled out uh, to ensure that we've got success at the end of the day. So if this lift count calculator uh, would work for anybody here, just download it from the website and uh, might be helpful to you. So uh, we'll go back in. Uh, this, that starts to identify more risk to us, how many loads coming off the ground and so on. And as the risk gets, uh, gets higher, uh, you know, we, I, I'll go back one frame. I will want to share one thing with you. We, when we have, there are matrices and um, you might say the old MORT system, the management oversight risk tree, but it is, it is a process. You know, if we have 1,000 lifts, uh, or 10,000 or 100,000, uh, our MORT system or our risk assessment system may say that we're going to have 2.5 accidents for every 100,000 lifts. And it may be a, a, a smash finger, it may be a, a cut sling, it may be uh, contact with the load with an obstruction and we do some physical property damage. So that's where we want to really start deciding can we work those out of our system? Can we get rid of or minimize or lower the risk? Because you will never eliminate it totally. It is about uh, minimizing the risk through proper methods. And then there's some things that are just simply beyond our control that are out of sight uh, and um, latent defects potentially with some equipment that you just can't see unless you fully disassemble a crane you know, piece by piece. But there, there are numbers that most organizations can come up with and so it is a, an effort to minimize that risk. And in some cases, and uh, we've got a great shipyard client down in the south, uh, cover uh, three states. And they're probably into um, 
in a 10-year period, they're probably into 8 million lifts just by themselves in a 10-year period. And they understand and know we've got to lower this uh, risk potential because there's if, if no action is taken, they know they probably can count on uh, 6 to 10 accidents a year related to load handling. So uh, they, they took a very aggressive step and created a crane and rigging manual that became their Bible. We helped write that up for them and procedures and documentation and um, training requirements, uh, competency requirements. And it really has turned their organization around. It's, they wanted to compete on a world stage and their management uh, has continued to uh, remark about the improvements made in that, in that organization and on site. So this number became quite significant to them and they responded very, uh, very aggressively to it. So there's a lot of successes when we start paying attention and throw on a throw on a little bit of money at something, you know, twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars here or there, compared to a million dollar, multi million dollar accident, uh, it can be a good way to uh, nip that in the bud. Let's go to the next panel here. Um, you know, I did notice uh, th this is something we're certainly all seeing more of in uh, ASME B thirty point five. If you don't have some of the ASME documents, I, I'd encourage you to uh, start building your libraries, uh, most of you do. If you want to email me and, uh, hey, which ones might be best suited for our operation and, and organization, I'd be happy to work with you on a listing. I'm the vice chairman for the main committee for B30. And I don't speak for ASME. I'm a volunteer just like everybody else. Uh, I don't represent ASME as an official. I'm not a, I'm not a full-time paid staff. but. The you know the anything I can share with you, I'd be happy to. I will. I do plan to share with you a little bit on the progress for the P30 group, which is the lift planning group today. And uh, but in this B30.5 was the sort of the first point. And it's sort of uh, if any of you, uh, this would be just kind of check and see who the old timers are on online here with this. But uh, Howard Shapiro. Uh, is was the uh, probably the grandfather of cranes. And he wrote a book called Cranes and, Cranes and Derricks. And uh, so I think it's in the fourth edition right now. But he probably, uh, I'm guessing 18 years ago or so, he started to delineate who some of the, who the uh, key folks are necessary to actually successfully uh, manage load handling activities. And he actually started uh, identifying the terms lift director, site supervisor, crane owner, crane operator, crane user. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the B30.5 group adopted that. Howard served on that committee for a long time. His son, Larry Shapiro, works with us on the P30 lift uh, planning group. And uh, that actually now has sort of transmitted itself in some part and parcel over to the OSHA 1400 document. So uh, you know we've all benefited uh, by uh, so the folks that have gone before us. And I'll tell you, most of the reason that we're do, even doing this today is really for generations downstream. This P30 group is, uh, which has got its hands all over, this ASME P30 is, is an equal standing group next to B30. And we've taken that, this same uh, core uh, selection list, and we actually have now, I think, uh, 16 people identified by title, and that's we're, that's all in proposal format, it's not been final balloted or anything, and then it needs to go to public review, but we've identified lift planners, soil engineer, uh, project engineer, um, rigging vendor. Uh, I know Barstow Rigging is online with us, Shero uh, Lifting Products, Super Slings, we've got a number of rigging, Mazella, we've got a lot of rigging vendors on, online with us today. They're all a very important part of the lift planning process, and so this group of five that we see initially listed, this will become uh, much more expanded downstream, I believe, in my heart, that we're going to end up seeing a lot more folks involved uh, and uh, by title and by description and by uh, request for uh, participation. Their roles and responsibilities, we'll cover that in a little bit more in depth. And um, I did notice even in, um, in if you there was one reference to a lift director in the new OSHA 1400 document. I believe it's in 1432. Talks about a lift director would be uh, overseeing multiple uh, multi-crane lifts. And so the inference is there that hey, we need somebody that's sort of the ringleader, the 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 main person that's 
he doesn't have to be the Johnny expert in everything, but he's actually got a fairly good foundation uh, in uh, subject content. Uh, and, and we'll describe a little bit about what his knowledge base needs to be in a minute. But we really need somebody that can pull the parties together and make things happen in a good way. So uh, these are all going to be uh, uh, better described not only this morning, but in additional documents that you're going to see downstream. Uh, the roles and responsibilities, we know we've got signal person, rigger, and operator in uh, 1926. And also, I think they'll be uh, in, uh, rolled over eventually into our discussions in general industry. But there are qualification requirements uh, coming out um, and are out in, in play in the marketplace. And certainly, in some cases, uh, certification requirements. Uh, I think what we need to do as a group in our industry um, whether it's chemical or nuclear, um, oil and gas, maritime, we've got a lot of different industries represented this morning, is to recognize the titles and research their, their descriptions of their tasks, and then also certainly research what training requirements are, are necessary to get them to be able to perform those tasks sufficiently and competently. And uh, you know, that's, that's all about building folks up uh, so that we have a, a better, better operation, better activity going on. I think what happens, you know, in training and education, we have a training event and we take some people to a new level. Sometimes the knowledge uh, gets lost over time or gets unused, but we re-implement a new training activity and it takes them up to a new level. And eventually, you know, in a 5 and 10 and 15 year uh, window, we've got uh, somebody that's really, you know, op able to operate at that level. Here's the here's the key question: Where do you where do we think that uh, lift directors come from? You know, lift directors come from uh, a, a very skilled operator who also knows a lot about rigging, who also knows a lot about process and methodology. Uh, lift directors can come from the rigging side. That the guy's hanging chokers and slings one day and starts to get educated about journeyman rigging information, master rigger information, advanced rigging. He has to become knowledgeable about load handling equipment, like mobile cranes, tire cranes, derricks, all the other uh, type of lifting equipment. And then he also has to get educated about the methods, the processes, procedures, how to write a lift plan, how to dictate and identify the events and sequences of step one, step two, step three, all the way through. So um, it, a lift director could come from um, the, uh, the, the engineering side, from project engineering. Uh, we need to school them up in crane usage, school them up in rigging activities. But from a method and procedures and sequences standpoint, they probably got that pretty well locked in. So you know, our our future folks come from all different craft areas, all different backgrounds and disciplines. But as we continue to um, educate them, uh, we get them to those higher plateaus, and that's where that's where our backbone, our you know, our base and foundation of our organization. That's where our talent is coming from. And so investing in that, you find those folks that have a passion for doing this. And boy, those are folks you want to key in on because they're our future leaders when it comes to this kind of, uh, this kind of load handling activity. Let's take a look at the uh, next item. Uh, the, we, you, we, uh, you know, ignorance is not going to get us, uh, is no excuse. And we need to know the requirements. Certainly outside is um, the federal OSHA requirements, and those are always, don't forget, and we have some uh, folks online from OSHA this morning. Um, and we've got, uh, we know that those are minimums. The ASMEs are, uh, are guidelines. They're, they're not, they're not uh, regulations in the former sense that we know about OSHA. Uh, ASME doesn't walk around with a compliance finding, uh, a book, and they don't write tickets. Uh, OSHA uh, is the regulatory authority. Uh, there's uh, state plan states and federal OSHA, maritime requirements, uh, all, all kinds of shipyard, ship repair, terminal operations. Uh, OSHA has, swings a pretty wide loop, and, uh, but remember, they're a minimum, and so we can always meet or exceed those minimum requirements. OSHA is there as a and ASME is there as a user guideline for safety and operations and activities. So uh, notice we've got uh, CSA, Lawler from the UK. Uh, you may have DOE requirements. We may have 
Uh, additionally, we may have site requirements. So uh, th those are external in most cases. Internal, uh, what we might be able to improve our operations with. Uh, do you have, do you, does your company have a crane and rigging or lo load handling um, manual or guideline in-house today? Here's how we will conduct our business. And th those are the, if we don't have a guidebook, uh, we don't want to be dragging, dragging from 16 different resources. We'd like to actually have one document in-house that already is the compilation of those requirements, and this is how we'll conduct our business for load handling. So I'd strongly endorse or encourage you to consider uh, getting a, a, a crane and rigging manual in-house and in place. We can help you with that. There's a lot of resources uh, on how to get that accomplished. Certainly in-house to make sure that the equipment's in good shape. Uh, I would tell you that probably at least 40% uh, of the accidents we get involved with from a rigging standpoint have prior damage. And that means probably we're not doing a, as good a job uh, in the inspections as we should be. So the prior damage reduces tensile strength, starts at a 5 to 1 design factor potentially, and works its way down to 4 to 1, 3 to 1, 2 to 1 because of damage, ultraviolet ray degradation on slings or cuts and melting and all kinds of things that happen to synthetic rigging um, or chain slings that then end up with significant wear. Just, you, you sort of you pick the category. But we, that tensile strength reduces and all of a sudden the load imposed exceeds the remaining tensile strength and we've got an accident. So inspections are huge. Uh, this, this accounts for the load handling equipment LHEs besides the rigging and the work. And then overseeing the, uh, our internal process for how we're making sure to prepare our folks um, to tackle the jobs we're asking them to do. Um, I would, I would ha need to really enforce with you that the quality of instruction that they're going to get, does it have hands-on in it? I mean, that's a huge, you can't go to learn to be a master rigger in a hotel. You know, it's really, you got to have hands-on stuff, you got to get dirty, you got to figure things out and problem solve on the fly, and that's what a good training session does. It challenges the participants and gets them to uh, uh, resolve those answers using their the, the knowledge that they've gained and their experience that they have. It all combines together to end up with some good solutions. The quality is really critical, and i got to uh, really enforce with you the documentation is uh, uh, really key. Uh, as you all know, uh, if, if you've been through an OSHA, uh, an accident with OSHA showing up at your door, my goodness, the, uh, the first question out of their mouth sometime, you know, after, after the, the folks are carted off in an ambulance is, okay, I want to see your documentation for training, for inspections, for operations, for assignments, for qualifications. The, the first thing you're going to look for is, is the documentation package. So please make sure that we start, you know, if we haven't started documenting, uh, we document for our clients. Oh, uh, we use a, tr a trem tremendous uh, tracking system for documenting, for training activities, knowledge and content, and then qualifications. And it's really important that we have that uh, back backbone. It also helps us see where the gaps are, where are the deficiencies, what, what are we asking certain folks to do, and we look across the small matrix and say, gee, you know, we're asking them to do these three things, and they've never had any training for it. We're all just, it's all by observation or by, uh, by time in service. And we really need to make sure we've got those stones in the pouch, you know, to be able to sling at uh, that monster when it shows up. So documentation is really important, and it will help us find where the, where the gaps and deficiencies are. Number five is new systems. I, I got to tell you, new system methods and packaging. This is beginning to be a huge element for us. Packages, load packages are not getting smaller, they're getting bigger. And what we learn from the big boys, you know, the folks that handle the 500 ton, 800,000, 2,000 ton load lifts, we are, we are dialing that down into the 50,000 pound, the 25 ton, 50 ton lifts. We're able to, it's sort of like the old space program, well, or the technology that helped us get to the moon, This we are able. We were able to take that technology and put it into everybody, everyone's uh, life with new products, new te new um, techniques, new equipment, uh, carbon fire. I mean, tons of things that have grown out of a program like that. Well, we're doing the same thing with big lifts. 
the methods and approach that they're taking for modularization where instead of handling 1,400 pieces, now, now those 1,400 pieces are being combined into uh, 300 pieces, 200 pieces. So they're getting prepackaged. That means the center of gravity is going to be weird someplace. The weight obviously increases. The pick points for the load rack and frame that's going to be able to support this entire load, they've got to be well designed and well placed. So we are asking manufacturers when we get this modernization uh, approach, design these lifting points so that we got a fighting chance in the field to handle this stuff. Certainly going to need bigger equipment, but we got to be able to handle it so we don't damage it just in the rigging method. So it really it's got to be field ready for installation, and we need some we need some help in uh, getting getting this these types of uh, equipment components as they get produced. Uh, so that we can do a good job in the field with proper uh, rigging capacities, load handling equipment capacities, and such that we don't damage the load just because we are trying to uh, rig this uh, a little bit of a Billy Bob approach and do it proper, do it, uh, do it according to the plan and rigging to the CG in every case. So let me take a look real quick with you. I know we're running into time here. Um, these are, uh, this is just a review of the five items we just discovered. This is a recorded uh, event, and we do have this available to you after the uh, program is over. But there's uh, just a recap of the five things that we've talked about is commit to excellence, uh, understand your risk and exposure, get your uh, person, uh, personnel uh, properly trained and understand what their tasks are, know the law, and then be prepared for these new items that are coming down the pike. Uh, it's it's going to get more difficult, not less difficult. So in that, seeing that coming down through the the, the tunnel here, we've got to make sure our people are up to uh, up to speed to be able to deal with it. These are the folks that uh, are really the five folks that are primary. And I uh, when I asked uh, uh, Natalie and we worked on getting this layout for you, um, you'll notice that uh, this we kind of retitled this load handling activity team up here. And uh, you're going to see some new terminology. And I'm going to ask you to sort of uh, go with me on this. We always think about cranes. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, mobile cranes, tower cranes, bridge cranes, and so on. But I will endorse uh, to you that we're thinking very hard about really calling this big category LHE, load handling equipment. And that'll be the new term that we're using, at least in the P30 group, for identifying anything that picks, moves, drags, pushes a load is going to be termed LHE, load handling equipment. And it'll be the LHE operator, the LHE um, lift director. Uh, and so that you'll, you'll see that a lot more, I think, in print, in discussion in articles and magazines, and certainly in this new P30 document. I believe we will actually close the door on that and make that sort of our standard discussion point. But in any case, the people don't change. The people, the lift director for that, or site supervisor, uh, operator, user, and owner, those are the five basics. And, and as I told you a minute ago, we have as many as 16 identified in this new, uh, potentially for this new P30 group coming out. Under the lift director, I'm just going to cover a couple of these because uh, we're, we're getting a little short on time. But under the lift director, uh, you, you know that um, He's got a whole raft of uh, elements to be responsible for. But it, if you take a look and uh, get the new document, there's a, uh, a brand new uh, 2011 document that was just released early in 2012 for B30.5. And take a look in, and review those five categories and those descriptions as to responsibility. Um, Lift director uh, needs to be present at the job site during lifting activities. Uh, stopping crane operations if alerted to unsafe conditions. Needs to ensure the preparation of the area uh, to support the crane has been completed. But you know what? The lift director isn't responsible for the soil. You know, he would look to the site supervisor to confirm. Because the site supervisor has the stroke to go out over the site to make sure we've got soils analysts, geotech compaction activities have taken place, power line issues are there, he's got to mitigate those, uh, traffic control, safety for other uh, employees. He may have process equipment, they've got flow lines, a product that may be a paper mill or refinery where lifting activity is taking place. He's the buffer, the, the 
site supervisor is really the buffer for the lift director to help ensure that the operations side is covered and help, and he's a resource. That, that site supervisor, he or she is a resource to the lift director to ensure that, okay, I've got all the other bases covered, you just handle the lift, and what do you need to know, what can I help you with to help ensure that we've got a successful um, setting for you to operate in. So lift director is, he really oversees the, the riggers. Uh, he has to, he, he doesn't, um, he may not be the, the immediate director of the operator, but he works with the operator, the LHE operator with weight, CG, um, tick points that he's satisfied with, um, radius, of course, and height, length, reach, all those things. He, he works with that operator to help ensure that we've got the right equipment doing the right job uh, based on the task at hand, based on the site conditions at hand. Um, then it obviously works with the signal persons, the spotters, all the other people that may be uh, attending to this uh, load handling activity. So that's really the lift director's got a whole boatload of um, folks to oversee. He doesn't have to be at every lift. He really needs to put the plan in place and the operator and the rigging gr group go about the work practices. The, there is an en encouragement by ASME that the lift director is on site when lifting activity is going on, but he doesn't have to be um, at every lift. Uh, the, the items, a lot of standard lifts getting made. He likely will be very involved in all the critical lifts that are taking place. But my suggestion to you is, hey, have more than one lift director on your property. You know, have two, four, six, or eight and that are competently um, and, and properly qualified. You want to make sure you've got backups, people go on vacation, go on hunting trips and whatnot. You've got to have enough people out there that are, have that same skill level that understand that. I, I would suggest to you that we have, um, there just for the lift director, and we're only, we're, we're, this really gets down to um, the, the lift director's kind of got a th three legs here on this stool, and that is uh, LHE. He's got to have knowledge about load handling equipment, whether that's the crane gantry systems, jacking and rolling skid systems, all that. He really has to have a, a good knowledge about rigging, and then certainly with methods, um, sequence of events, and uh, the procedures, and and how to. And I got to tell you, leadership. Uh, you may, you know, you may. That may not be in a safety manual, but you got to have leadership from this lift director that can help satisfy issues, resolve problems, uh, lead people, encourage people to do the right thing at the right time. He, he, they do need leadership skills to some level to be able to, to, to head this type of organization activity up. So the lift director may not be um, a, an old dyed in the wool rigger, may not be an old dyed in the wool operator, but he's got, so when, from a training standpoint, educational standpoint, we actually have to make sure we've covered and given the lift director the, um, the, the tools to do the job right and um, the education and the foundation to do the job right. If we're missing one of those three legs, obviously that little stool is going to fall over. So we really need to make sure we've got, we've got everything in his backpack and we've prepared him. If we're going to have expectations, you know, we, always, we always hate the... Um, uh, having to have the responsibility with no authority and um, or responsibility and the accountability issue or responsibility without the knowledge. I mean, there's always ties together. We really need to make sure we've given that person all the tools necessary to do the job he's got to do. So I will uh, get that out of the way. I know we've got site supervision. Um, they need to understand. They not have to be a crane expert. Um, but they need to be able to, uh, certainly in a support role, and quite often their, their main uh, in, influence is going to be about uh, the, the people on site, the production activities that are going on, and also the, um, the safety elements. They'll, they'll interchange and intertie with the site safety folks. And uh, the uh, conditions, the ground conditions, maybe, or power lines and all the other, other elements that go with it. They are uh, an active member of the team. Uh, they don't typically get in and, and drive or, or serve as a substitute lift director, but they are a substantial resource party that helps 
uh, successful activities go forward. So I don't think I'll get too far into LHE operator certainly is qualified. Let me get to the next frame with that. This person is qualified uh, to operate, set up, erect, dismantle, understands the limitations. That's certainly the big thing. I think that this person needs to know the limitations of the LAT, the load handling equipment uh, that, that we're going to use for that lifting activity and or uh, subsequent production work. So, um, you know, somebody called me the other day and said, where does it say you can choke with a choker hitch uh, with a web sling without a shackle? And really the answer is there's a lot of things that are uh, not stated in the approval method that most of the things we see written either in OSHA or ASME are the prohibitions, the things we can't do. And so the, the good practices aren't always uh, well, you know, well displayed in every sense and every, every uh, field and discipline. Typically what we really have to be cognizant of and every time is, okay, what are the limitations? What do, what do I know I can't do? And let's stay away from those and proceed forward with what we are already trained in as good practices. The lift uh, LHE uh, user uh, or crane user or LHE user, that's the person that matches up the crane or the LHE to the job. That's sort of an estimator planner. It all, this person also makes sure that the uh, equipment is well maintained and by qualified persons that are competent to do the maintenance and the repairs for that equipment. So the LHE uh, user is all about the machinery and making sure, because that's the muscle moving that object. And their task and calling is to make sure it's in good shape and been, been taken care of by uh, qualified persons that know how to keep the, the machine in top flight condition. And the last person here is the LHE owner. And that is, you know, he's got a, he's got a significant role and part of this he may not be in, certainly involved in every lift, or in, and it won't be as a general rule, but that owner is to make sure that the uh, unit is, and I'll just use the term legal, that means it's properly, properly maintained, it meets all the manufacturer specifications or requirements, they're attending to any uh, uh, improvement uh, plans that submitted by the manufacturer to upgrade that equipment or to uh, do warranty work or repairs, keeping it in top flight condition, they're also uh, helpful to the rigging team, crane and rigging team with the, um, the uh, I'm going to just call this the crane manual or LHE uh, documentation. Those are the operations, maintenance, repair, lubrication, all the other uh, documentation package that goes with that piece of lifting equipment that that's available to them. The, the machine is, um, from a safety standpoint, has the appropriate stickers. Uh, safety stickers, uh, it has, uh, he's, he's got the, uh, it, it may be calibration uh, for some of the uh, low moment indicators and some of the more sophisticated computer uh, units that are in machines today. Those are, his job is really to make sure we've got a really good top flight running uh, piece of equipment uh, for which we can use to go forward. So those are, uh, those are just a quick rundown of the, of the folks. Uh, and I want to uh, take a look. Uh, we have a, um, uh, a next little uh, section here. We're getting very, pretty close to the end. Uh, but this, uh, I think we have another poll I'd like to uh, submit to you here. And uh, this has to do with, uh, uh, this has got uh, managing uh, uh, documentation for simple lifts and, and or critical lifts. These have to do with um, uh, would a critical lift planning sample document be helpful to you in the new ASME P30 lift planning volume? And that's our quick poll. And so we're, we're suggesting to, uh, within this new ASME P30 lifting group, there are three of us actually on this call in, and we're considering, we're not sure, but we're considering if we might put an appendix in the back that has a sample lift planning document, would that be helpful to you, yes or no? And if you all would respond to that, I'd appreciate it. And I do appreciate uh, your, your input and contribution. So take a moment and vote on screen and let us know what your thoughts are and then we'll go forward. I can take that back to, uh, there are 20 folks that are main uh, committee members and a number of alternates, lots of contributing members. 
and we certainly appreciate your input, and I'll take that back to the committee and let them know your general feeling about uh, having a sample documentation package in the back of this uh, volume, and uh, we appreciate your input. Okay, so, and let's see. Uh, looks like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's 95% yes and 5% no, so thanks for the input there. That's great. Okay, uh, I just will say, um, for a simple, com simple to complex lifting activities, we can call them anything we want. They can be standard or critical. Sometimes nuclear people call them high consequence lifts and so on. Um, there can be repetitive lifts within um, simple lifting and repetitive lifts in complex lifting. So those are sort of absorbed there. But uh, it's, to, it's what your organization decides to um, qualify and classify as a standard lift or a critical lift. And I, I think on a future uh, webinar, I'd like to have some time to go through how those classifications might stand, what might influence those decisions, and uh, the elements, whether it's about risk or about hazards to personnel, hazards created by the environment, super high wind conditions, all, all kinds of things that come into it. But I'd like to kind of go through those with you. I'd like to do that maybe in a future um, presentation. Um, so in the um, part of this is once we identify this standard on one side and critical on another, what, what rigging techniques and applications are necessary for our folks? And that's education. And, and I will beg you to uh, take a look at your rigging inventory and your crane inventory. But boy, if we've got the right tools, uh, for our folks, we're asking them to use a certain uh, types of slings or spreader bars, lifting beams, all that kind of thing. We've got to really make sure that we, uh, if we're going to have expectations for proper rig rigging methodology, we really should invest uh, in good rigging equipment that's going to accommodate the loads that we're going to ask them to handle and uh, make sure that that equipment's in good shape. So a lot of standard lifts. Uh, you know, that's the lion's share of the work activities to go on in, in a mar marketplace. And uh, providing the proper rigging is uh, key to making that uh, happen and happen well. Certainly, uh, we talked a minute ago about the uh, making sure our folks are trained in inspection and handling procedures because a lot of times the lift director will turn over a whole day's work to an operator and a rigger, and uh, they understand they've got to move five different series of loads and it's really not a, it's not a challenge, but we want to make sure that we understand that that proper load handling method has been in, in, uh, put into place. We do understand the, the hazards associated with that. Uh, a lot of folks get injured because in how we uh, put rigging to a uh, load uh, installation and removal. Uh, sling slap people. Uh, sometimes we use a crane to drag the rigging out from underneath the load, unfortunately, and loads tip over, slings get damaged, people get whipped with slings flying at them. So just uh, we want to make sure our folks don't get lazy and, you know, they uh, use the right methods. We'll always remove the rigging by hand and let that and get that crane to fly it out of the way or drag it out of the way or pick it up and, and, and carry it. We want to make sure that um, our procedures are, these can be napkin-based procedures or formal 42-page uh, written documents. But the procedures, and it is the step-by-step -step sequence, how many times have we all try to lift something up in a, in a facility and the overhead crane's grunting and straining and growing, and then all of a sudden the load springs up. We busted two bolts that were still bolted in. Uh, lo the load handling procedures have got to document and dictate. All, all equipment is freed and ready to fly. It can't be still anchored to something by a weld or bolts or other connection points. So part A's got to be removed first, then B, then C. We can't get too far ahead of the game, and that's really where we need to slow our people down a little bit and make sure that uh, everybody is... Um, doing it in the right sequence of events. And then certainly, we got a lot of helpers out there, signals and taglines, uh, spotters, and those fall into both the standard lift and critical lift category. Their positioning, their observation, their ability to see and witness what's happening. They're trained properly to uh, understand the dynamics and reaction of the load when it leaves the ground, whether it's a, a gantry system or a mobile crane or overhead crane. So signalers, their education, as well stated in the new OSHA document and the ASME guideline, is uh, signalers need to know a lot more than that, just uh, throwing hands up in the air. 
we are past the day when we uh, have at, are asking the youngest kid on the crew to do the signaling because he knows the least about doing all the technical elements. We really need to have sophisticated signalers out there working with the operators on an as needed, as needed basis, and they really understand their assignment. Um, let's take a look uh, very briefly. And uh, in this simple to complex uh, lifting activities, we've already discussed a little bit about the performance of lift director, rigger, operator, and signal person. Those are the, those are the activity folks. And then uh, the critical lift planning, that can take anywhere from uh, 20 minutes uh, to 20 months. I mean, it, it can be a huge uh, drawn out uh, plan or can be happening very quickly. But we have really a, a significant checklist of items to cover in establishing a critical lift plan. Uh, there's probably 10 different categories that uh, we, we've already in, uh, endorsed and solidified as to the elements that to um, attend to or to check when we're um, creating or developing a critical lift plan. And I, I would like to cover that on a future webinar. Uh, obviously, the contributions, these are all resource people, field engineers, superintendents, and managers. They all have, uh, they've got resource, they've got information that we need sometimes for successful lifting activities. And so having their ear, having their uh, input is really important because certain parts are going to be critical to the success of the activity. Uh, we've got a, uh, you know, a question came up during, uh, in the development of this about the ocean ASME regulations and how they affect you. I think this is the biggest thing that we've got to watch out for. And that is, uh, what is a construction related activity? You may be a power plant or a refinery, but it is a, um, what, do you believe that you conduct construction-related activities? And one thing you want to watch out for, if you have to pull a permit to do some work or you are actually upgrading, enhancing, or involved in complex lift activities, even though your, pur your purpose and calling is a chemical plant, you make airplanes, uh, you, you make uh, rail cars for a railroad company, you're actually in the manufacturing business, but are the, is some of the work being done at your site upgrading equipment, upgrading facility, or enhancing the um, site of some type, you'd be shocked. I, I've done a number of audits recently, and, and I would say probably an average is about 40% of the lift activities maintenance groups get involved in end up with uh, being actually denoted as um, uh, construction work versus maintenance or uh, re planned repair, a planned uh, replacement of bearings and, and brakes. I noticed in the reply to the poll here, we've got 88% of the people say yes and 12% no. Thank you. I'd take, I'd take a hard look at the activities. The, the, big, uh, that, the reason it leads to that, one thing, and uh, we do have OSHA people on the, on the call with this, but I think they would endorse this. Uh, we, you can go to the OSHA.gov website and, and uh, go in and type in questions or interpretation requests on just about anything. And you get a pretty good response, 24 to 48 hours. And I've talked to, obviously, numerous OSHA people face to face. It is not about the industry that you're in. It's about the activity. Now, what is it that we're doing? And that's the main thing that will drive some of the decisions we have to make downstream. Because if it's construction-related activity, then we're immediately into having certified crane operators, uh, qualified riggers qualified signal persons, all of those things start to kick into gear. And though you may never have had to have that in the past, um, now today that is the day uh, between now and 2014 for operators, but already immediately for riggers and signal persons, this qualification process is kicking into gear. So it's the activity itself, it's not the site. All construction companies certainly already know they're in this basket. It's the general industry folks uh, that may uh, not really realize that oh my gosh, we're in it and we're up to our necks and we need to have certain people with certain qualifications in certain categories. And that means training and education and procedures and methods. All those things have to be in play. It's not just to go out and get a crane operator with a card. It's actually about uh, doing something significant with your uh, process and methodology. Let's take a look at the next item here. Um, what are we going to see uh, downstream about qualification and certification? Um, I, I, I think at the end of the day, the quick answer here is 
OSHA has already made statements about who needs to be certified and who needs to be qualified, and that's very evident in a lot of the construction items I just mentioned on the last frame. ASME, I don't think you're going to see the word certified in ASME. Uh, the we're going to we're 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 staying on uh, on track with qualified person and then certainly folks that have a personnel competency level. And that's kind of a new buzzword we're implementing into ASME B30 in all, all volumes. And it is about their, uh, that will be established by training, experience, knowledge, and performance, which really parrot uh, the OSHA definition for qualified person, qualified rigor, qualified signal person. I think the main thing that ASME is uh, really going to be putting out on the floor is it's all about uh, performance, and performance has got to come from, as we stated, uh, from training, experience, knowledge, and um, uh, degree, potentially. Uh, so all those elements will be coming from, uh, and, and we're all driving to the same thing. Are we capable and competent to perform the work we're being asked to do? Let's take a look here. We're just, uh, I've got some very uh, uh, good items to finish out with here with you. Um, I, can't, I can't encourage you enough to, um, if, if you hear me say nothing else today, document everything that you're doing. Skills and knowledge of your personnel, uh, your, uh, in some cases your procedures. That starts with a crane and rigging manual. How will we conduct our work? We, if we don't have some guideline in-house, we're probably swimming upstream very, very heavily. It's, re it's a really hard struggle. So we need to have a plan. We need to have a, a process going forward. But document the, the process, the, uh, the methods used. And we take a, heck, even in manufacturing, we'll take a, a lot of photo series of even the assembly process and the rigging methodology and load handling that's done. And that stays with that station. So we're building a, a picture book and a methodology system within that organization so that as machinists or operators come in and come and go out, the process is always in place. We don't have to reinvent something new every time a new person shows up at that workstation. So track and document your methods and then uh, personnel for training and qualification. Documentation is really key here. So I'm sure you've heard that enough from me. You know, I, I, this really leads to something altogether different, but there, and there's a bigger, much bigger picture than this, but I ask uh, that this be put into our presentation today, and it's what is the true cost of training, but I'm going to um, springboard this into equipment maintenance, because from a management standpoint, it's critical, and the inspections that we're doing for uh, all the equipment that we have on site. But this is really a good eye-opener. We developed this to help, and a number of you uh, have seen this um, potentially, but notice that um, for, for a um, two-day course, uh, 12 people, uh, just a standard training course, it doesn't really, you know, you pick the subject, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, what we've identified is the lost production for, the, uh, for those people to get out of the, off the floor, out of the facility, out of the location, they have a certain dollar value that they should be contributing to the company's bottom line every day. So when you add that up, plus lost wages, uh, plus and then the um, then this this basket materials, travel, and training fee, you know, for even a two-day course that that on the on the surface looks like it's a thirty-five hundred dollar course, you know, you may be in the thirty, thirty-five, forty thousand dollar range. When you really add it all together, so when you commit yourself to uh, having a training course of some type or an inspection service company come in and do work for you with, with crane shutdown or equipment maintenance as a third party, it really starts to, gee, what's it going to cost us to shut that equipment down and who's the vendor or what's the supplier that we're going to use to get that done? And um, even for half the price, whether it's training, inspections, or equipment, so here's half the price, it's less than 5% difference in the overall big picture price that ends up as the ticket at the end of the day. That's a management uh, uh, overview. That's not a purchasing agent overview. So the lowest price that you're going to go out and pick, and because we, uh, we've got four mobile cranes here on our property in Woodland. I know when we hire a crane service company, uh, inspection company to come in, 
we're going to have to shut those cranes down for a certain period of time. I don't want to go looking for the cheapest outfit um, just because on the surface the daily rate or the hourly rate's uh, really nice and cheap. I do want to look for people that are going to deliver uh, the best quality I can can acquire in the marketplace. And and it's not about ITI. It's about what are we what are we costing the organization and the hidden costs are the things that bite us in the rear end. We've got to really watch out for, gee, we're going to have this equipment shut down or this area site location activity shut down for some of this, act, this work. And um, the, real, the small ticket is the price that we pay for the daily or hourly, but it's the bigger price of the shutdown. So take that in consideration. I think that's a management decision when we do that. Uh, I can tell you specifically on the inspections, boy, when we hire folks, you know, I, I almost go running away from the people that that come in at half the price of everybody else on the on the plate. I think, geez, what are they really uh, offering here? Because if I have to spend the money twice, I really get ticked off. Let me tell you. So if I don't get a good value uh, for the dollar spent on the first go around, and I got to spend that money twice by shutting that equipment down for another three days or five days for all that, I'm I'm a one hot puppy. I just gotta uh, make sure that we're spending the money right. And the hourly and daily rate really isn't uh, isn't isn't the issue. Uh, let's take a look. I think we've got a um, one more poll as well to uh, put in front of you, and uh, that's um, very would be helpful to us. Uh, future subjects that you'd like to see in a, a next month or following month's webinar, uh, you'll see in, on the screen there assembly disassembly director uh, lift planning considerations, a effective training methods for field folks. Uh, hey, we could do one on ASME updates, uh, e-learning op opportunities, and there's a number of other elements. And certainly type in um, questions uh, or comments or uh, contributions if that list isn't full. But uh, go ahead and take a vote on that list. And uh, I do have some uh, questions to answer uh, in the um, uh, that were sent in prior to the – I'm sorry we're going over time here, but I really feel – Everybody that can stay, I would love to have you stay and, and work with us here. Um, I had one question in from uh, uh, Donna Donna Dutcher as what's acceptable drift for overhead crane. That's going to be Donna. That's going to be by manufacturer, but uh, typically, um, they're they're if if you have over an inch drift, once we end up with uh, releasing the power generation for the lower mechanism on an overhead crane. Um, there's a holding brake and closing brake. I would definitely get a hold of the manufacturer. They've got tolerances for shaw box, um, whiting, uh, Morse material handling, which is Kona cranes. Uh, each crane is going to have its own uh, allowable drift based on tonnage and its design. But boy, if you if we get uh, you know I, I when I use an inch, it's just a remarkable or noticeable um, uh, that when we de-energize or power off, we should that drift should be very minimal. Uh, clients have called us from power plants and other facilities that end up with six, eight, or ten inches. And uh, in based on the tonnage capacity of the crane, that's way too much drift, way too much uh, reaction. You, that's a perfect time when we get people's hands crushed because they think we're off the crane and it, and it keeps coming down. And we get things uh, smashed, gets bolts ruined that you're trying to for alignment and all. Uh, all the kinds of associated damage can occur, so uh, the drift should be minimal, uh, and sometimes uh, they almost uh, zero drift, uh, where we just immediately stop in the lowering mode. So, if you're observing more than an inch, I get a hold of the manufacturer immediately and say, "What's your tolerances and allowances?" And then they'll give you brake adjustment instructions and so on. Great question, Donna. I appreciate it. Uh, Pam, uh, Pamela Dickens. Uh, do we have a good definition for industry uh, to help determine critical lifts from ordinary lifts? And uh, you know, um, standard lifts. It's a great question. Uh, standard lifts end up um, lift considerations. Uh, let me take a um, sort of the standard lift category is. Um, it's what we might, we're going to use the phrases like routine and uh, low risk to 
and basically three categories, personnel, uh, equipment, which is the crane or load handling equipment, et cetera, low risk, and uh, also then low risk to uh, site equipment. And meaning, and that part of that means uh, there's no, nobody really in the landing zone or working in the fall zone. Um, it's a routine that we do this and have done this a dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of times. Uh, low risk to personnel. We have uh, uh, low risk to the equipment. We might be working in the uh, anywhere from 10% to 50% uh, of the equipment's capacity range. So that might be a good thing. The dollar value of the item being lifted is pretty low, and there's very low risk to site equipment. I think in the crit critical category, and this will probably be uh, more uh, well spoken on uh, on another on a future webinar. But it is, uh, I think the things that bite us in the rear end most are unique items that we we rarely lift. Might be a, a two-year, five-year, ten-year evolution, and maybe brand new. We've never done this before. It may be uh, near high capacity. So we may be looking at an object that might be in the 85 to 99 percent range of the crane's lifting capacity. What we may have is a high consequence, a high risk to associated equipment that might be flow lines. And if we contact or nick a big chlorine line, all of a sudden we have a release. We've got a general public uh, evacuation of 10,000 people. So all of those start to get into some of the, uh, some of the critical categories that it's uh, considerations for personnel. Uh, we've got people in the bite. People that are uh, actually down in a hole, got to receive a load, and they got to bolt it up and, and put it together. They don't have any space to run. They're in a very, very small area. There are some allowances by OSHA and ASME for people in those significant areas, try to minimize their exposure, build an escape route if possible. But if we've got people that are just really right in the landing zone, uh, and they, ha they have no out, they have no escape route. Uh, we would likely write, that, write a critical lift plan for those kinds of activities that um, get into um, those type of risk areas. It may have some uh, a critical lift plan may be required um, for a commercial decision. And, you know, harsh to say this, but it's a dollar value uh, or impact to the organization. If we drop this, it's a million dollars. If we drop this in the worst place, we'll shut our facility down for three months. So the commercial impact, it may, it may be uh, only a 10% load weight compared to the, the lifting uh, LHE's capacity. But if we make a mistake with it and we, have, we suffer this commercial impact, we may be out of business. So that may be driving the decision to uh, roll that into the critical lift category. So I don't know if I've done much of a good, a good job, uh, Pamela, to help answer your question, but um, it's when on a future webinar, I'd sure love to share with you some of the things that the P30 group is identifying for lifting categories and also um, the 10 steps that we think should be included in a, a critical lift plan. And that uh, you can give me a call, drop me an email. I can share some things of our thinking right now with you and be happy to go over some of those things uh, in advance. So uh, also we had a comment, uh, the weight and dimensions can't always be um, determining factors, and I agree with you. Um, those aren't always the driving things for deciding what's standard lift and what's critical lift. Um, it really gets down to are our people used to and are they uh, comfortable with and are they trained and qualified to handle the size, shape, and orientation of that load, particularly with the headroom issues that we've got sometimes. Uh, we've got a, we may end up with six inches of headroom clearance to get a load picked up and put up onto the back of a truck inside of a building. So. If that's a routine thing for them, they do it every day, that may be okay. But I'll tell you, a lot of folks get into uh, hit and limit switches, and um, we, we end up uh, six inches short, uh, will we'll not allow a project to go forward. So the pre-planning really is important. And it isn't always about weight. Um, it's all about the lift capacity of the equipment we're using and where its comfort level is. Uh, we've got some other questions here. Um, Conrad, uh, Hernandez subcontractors are qualifying their own riggers, but I'm finding out that their riggers really don't have clear understanding of proper rigging practices. 
I would say that's a huge issue in our marketplace. Who's doing the qualifying and what's their competency level? So unless you've really done it and you can really explain it and you really attend to all the elements really important on that subject, we're, we, we could do something in the field for 30 years but not actually be competent to instruct others in doing the same and doing it properly. My goodness, how many of us can raise our hands and say we learned something the wrong way 30 years ago and now we've been teaching people to do it wrong for 30 years. So it needs to be current practices, best, best methods, proven technique within capacity with proper methodology. So we do need to be relaying that. So the folks that do instruct for rigging, forklifts, telehandlers, uh, cranes, overheads, you name it, those folks that instruct really need to be dialed into what are their current requirements by OSHA, ASME, and the manufacturer as to the operation and management of that piece of equipment. Uh, he goes on to comment, I feel we're not uh, we're at risk uh, not requiring companies to have certified riggers. Do you foresee a change in subpart CC? I doubt it. I don't see a change in subpart CC. Um, with, I think we are where we are. I think qualified rigor is about the best we're going to get. Uh, it'll really get down to what I got to tell you, everybody online here is we're seeing a ton of folks requiring qualified riggers at job sites, obviously, but we're also seeing uh, certified riggers. And there are uh, a number of accredited organizations that offer a certification. It's all voluntary right now, but we're seeing a lot of folks, uh, job sites like, um, and I'll use somebody like a Bechtel or a Fleur or somebody, and it won't be them by name, but it'll be an organization maybe of that size. In certain organizations, they will be requiring certified riggers for a certain project site or work project going forward. So that means that they will have proven out not only using their training, but also proven out by written testing and practical testing a minimum acceptance level as to knowledge so that, when, so that they can perform their work and they've been proven against the national testing process. I don't see subpart CC, the 1400 document, expanding its definition of a qualified rigor into certified rigor. I'm, I'm just giving you the front up. I don't see it coming yet. We've got a question. Hi, John Anderson. Uh, uh, Brad Crane, uh, can the lift director and crane operator be the same person? That's an excellent question. Um, and, it, and there is no prohibition, John, against that. Uh, it can happen. The lift director can be the crane operator. Um, it, I think I think the big issue gets to be how complex is the lift activity get, and where can the operator not see, and then then we start to to probably uh, get more involvement with a qualified rigger, who in the qualified rigger might be a lift director as well. So um, break it down, and John's got a great example. Somebody's lifting a, a boom truck with uh, uh, putting an air conditioning unit up on top of a building, and the operator shows up with the boom truck. Can he be the lift director? I think part of that, John, too, is going to be by the contract. What's the contract state between the relationship between the installation company that's installing the unit and the crane service company that's providing the lift crane? We are really right now in the middle of a lawsuit uh, representing a client, and the real spitting contest is uh, we have two contracting groups working together to achieve a certain job at a, at a project site. One employee was lifted up and fell 70 feet. And um, the question gets to be, who was the lift director in this situation? Uh, obviously, there's a fatality in this. We're representing the state. Uh, but it gets down to who is the, um, who's, who's got the responsibility, authority, and or knowledge, and or by contract, who was assigned that responsibility? And I, at the moment, I can tell you the court's going to be deciding that pretty soon. But it is, uh, I think in some cases, uh, you're going to want to watch out. I think crane service companies that are online, you're going to want to watch out and not be offering lift director services in the form and shape and uh, body of your crane operator. Uh, that's a lot of responsibility to put on them. And without proper training knowledge and base, it may be offering some things you don't want to offer in some cases because it, it speaks about him managing the entire lift activity. And I'm not quite sure in, in a lot of cases that the operator is going to need, wants to be tagged as the lift director simultaneously. Smaller jobs, one man operations, you know, certainly we can see that. More complex activities, you're going to want a, a designated person as a lift director. It may be with your company as a crane service group, or it may be with the uh, other contractor's company 
but somebody's got to have the authority and responsibility to carry forward in that in that vernacular. So I'd be a little hesitant um, in in the in the single man operation. I certainly agree. Yes, and uh, and when you have uh, two or three riggers on site, signaler, and you've got a fairly complex activity going on. I don't think we want to uh, be pointing to the operator as the lift director in that situation. It really, uh, he can only control the seat so much from the seat. And I'm sure you'd agree with me, John, that uh, we're going to, we probably are ratcheted up to another level of lift activity between, somewhere between standard lift and critical lift, somewhere in there that we've got to have more competency uh, out on the ground so he can really be assured when we've got an issue, he can stop the job and take care of it. Uh, Phil Lorenzen, uh, where does OSHA draw the line between construction and maintenance? I would suggest, Phil, that you go online to OSHA.gov. I've done this numerous times, get the same answer back. I've talked to OSHA folks. And uh, here's, a good, here's a good example. In the maintenance activity, if, if a bearing or a gear, uh, gear has to be, is a planned replacement in the manufacturer of that um, Gearbox says in 18 months or in so many working hours you will have to replace this bearing or, or this gear. That's a planned maintenance event, and that would not be termed construction. It is. Uh, it, it's manufacturers are already telling us and tipping us off that we're going to have those issues to to deal with. When we get into um, construction side, is uh, we got to swap out this gearbox for another gearbox, and it may be bigger, larger, bigger footprint, or a motor has to be ramped up. Uh, to a, a larger size. The minute we replace something with an upgraded or a, a larger unit, that will be termed construction. I mean, I'm just telling you exactly what I've been told. Uh, when we put up a uh, false wall in a, in a building to help shield one area from another area, that's actually construction, not maintenance. Not building maintenance, it's construction. Replace that. Uh, even uh, I've got clients in chemical facilities that have uh, continuous corrosion issues replace uh, an outside exterior ladder access going up to the second or third floor uh, and just put new steel up and new ladder rungs and, and hand railing. When we do the demolition and take that out and replace it, it's not building maintenance, it's actually construction. So it's, uh, I'll tell you, the, um, we are getting better definitions and I would encourage you to go to OSHA.gov, submit a, a request for interpretation. They've even uh, noted complex rigging activities. So if we have to break a machine down sometimes past 50% of its entire housing, casing, and guts, they may term that, quickly term that construction, not general industry, because that's a major overhaul. Okay, uh, got, got one, uh, from, another one from Donna. Uh, that's really, this is why uh, general industry has said no to construction-related activities. However, however uh, this is true under OSHA construction classification. We have many construction activities here with contractors. Now what should I do? I think, Donna, the main thing is if your people are serving as riggers, they need to be qualified riggers according to the OSHA 1926.1400 document. If your people are signaling the contractors, crane operators, they need to be qualified to the same document, 1400. And if you email me, we can uh, send you back the uh, exact callouts within the 1400 document that requires that. If your people are serving as crane operators with your cranes, working with contractors, doing construction work, those crane operators have to be certified operators by November of 2014, or at least minimum qualified operators at this stage until they become certified in 2014. So if you're providing assistance to the contractors doing the work on site, your people are construction workers at that moment. They're not general industry workers. Great question. Okay, uh, let me take a look at, I've got some free uh, questions that came in. Uh, let's see, does, uh, oh, this is a great question. <clears throat> How are companies handling requirements for forklifts to the uh, fall under the crane standard when rigging under the fork? And uh, that was uh, by, uh, that was submitted by John Hart um, in Michigan. Um, that's a great question. We did ask that question for uh, OSHA, and the response was that the, Forklift operator doesn't need to be a certified crane operator if it's if it might be in a construction related activity. They it may not it's definitely not the same skill set. However, they do need to be qualified according to the OSHA 1910.178 forklift requirement. So if we're going to have a forklift or a telehandler in a construction environment, 
please go look at the 1910.178 requirement for powered industrial trucks. OSHA calls telehandlers, which are for, uh, rough terrain forklifts, they call those heavy powered industrial trucks. So they're still in the forklift family. Matter of fact, uh, I know a couple of OSHAs that call the uh, units like a MyJack, which is a rolling uh, self-contained uh, container unit or a load handling unit in the yard. They, they call those powered industrial trucks. So they are, uh, they need to be qualified to that, meaning the content, the operation skills, practices, performance, qualified as basically under the forklift standard for those various types of equipment, then they are okay to use um, those folks and that equipment in a construction mode when they put a lifting device slid onto the forks with a hook underneath it and hoist and transfer and move something to reset. They don't have to be a certified crane operator. That was not OSHA's intent. I just was at a meeting, a board meeting three weeks ago, and that question came up, and they were very satisfied that a, a qualified forklift operator is all that would be necessary in that situation. Uh, let's see, uh, I got a question uh, from uh, 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 Larry and uh, uh, Vivek. Uh, we have a factor of safety for web slings been decided. Yes, web slings in the U.S. is 5 to 1. Uh, that's the design factor for uh, webbing is 5. And so the rated capacity for, uh, let's say, a 6,000-pound sling is rated capacity. Its breaking strength will be uh, 6,000 times 5 would be 30,000 pounds. So 5 to 1 for web slings in the U.S. and round slings. Wire rope slings 5 to 1. Chain slings 4 to 1. Those are all under the ASME B30.9 document for slings. Uh, synthetic rope slings are taking the market by storm. You'll see a lot more of those in use with this HMPE type ropes. Um, you get the same uh, breaking strength and same working load limit, almost size for size for a three-quarter synthetic rope sling with a three-quarter wire rope sling. Certainly we have issues to deal with. We're protecting the slings, but strength-wise they're, they're getting there and they're, they're getting more prevalent in the workplace all the time. Uh, let's see, uh, from a safety um, Oh, I got a great question in here, and I don't know the answer to this. What is Nelson's triangle in relationship to rigging? I have no honking clue. I got, that was a great question, and I did searches and searches and tapped shoulders of people. Anybody ever heard of the Nelson's triangle? If so, email Mike at iti.com and tell me where the heck that might be. I don't know. I haven't ever seen that. Somebody named Nelson came up with a triangle for rigging. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there... Uh, Question from uh, Mayank, uh, is there guidance uh, for standard uh, or for multiple crane lifting? Yes, there is. I would endorse you, encourage you, first of all, to go look at the crane and, Cranes and Derrick, Howard Shapiro's book, edition four. There are multiple crane lift guideline. It's a nine-point guideline. The funny thing about it is the first point for multiple crane lifts is can you do it with one crane? That's the first question you ask. Instead of using two cranes or more, can this lift be done with one crane? Because when we add two cranes or more, two operators, two signalers talking to one signaler to get the primary uh, control system going, it, it just it compounds synergistically the risk and issues related to it anywhere from times three to times five. The risk goes up huge when we have a multiple crane lift activity. Some people do it every day of the week. But when it's a unique lifting activity for your operation and you've got folks that don't, you know, are not used to that type of lift work, it's really hazardous, really risky. Not that it's illegal and not that it's a bad thing, you know, altogether. There are multiple uh, crane guidelines. If you take a look at that uh, Cranes and Derrick's book, I, we have it in our bookstore. I've used it numerous times with clients. We do have it written up in our mobile crane operator uh, reference card. It, it is a very uh, um, so serious uh, lifting condition and operation to get involved in, and there are guidelines for that. Uh, there are, uh, in, in Howard's book, he talks about um, if you exceed 75% of either crane's capacity, you must write a lift plan. Uh, you can uh, understand how quickly you can get out of plumb one crane gets out of plumb, it pulls and drags the other crane with it, and if one crane goes down, almost inevitably the second crane 
follow it. So staying plumb, keeping the hoist lines vertical, no side loading to the crane, minimize the path area. Uh, it's obviously better if you can work two cranes side by side rather than having dually, dueling cranes where you're passing one load between another, uh, one load passes between two cranes. It can be a huge, huge issue. I'm talking mobile cranes and other boom style cranes. Overhead cranes, it's fairly uh, uh, controlled, uh, but it's all about center gravity and pick points. How much crane is crane A taken? How much is crane B taken? And are our operators synchronized? You know, at least from a practices standpoint, it might be a good thing to do a dry run with a multiple crane with a light dead load that you can afford to have issues with uh, and not pull the cranes down. So dry runs are are a good way to uh, minimize the risk related to a multiple crane lift activity. But get a hold of us, uh, my Inc., and we can help you uh, get more or get additional information uh, related to that. Um, another question, Ken Jacoby uh, had, uh, would it be uh, not be a good idea to have temperature ratings and limitation identified on BTH hardware uh, as well as the safe working load? And you know, it's a good idea. Uh, I think the um, issues get to be uh, it, it. It would be an excellent. Uh, contribution on a lifting beam, spreader bar, magnets, anything that's got to work in a hot furnace area or high elevated temperatures do not exceed a certain Fahrenheit Celsius. Uh, it's a great, it would be a great instruction. If, if that is the situation in your facility or location, you certainly can contact the manufacturer and ask them to state on the identification plate, please put maximum allowable temperature for operating conditions for this lifting being spreader bar, magnet, tongs, whatever equipment you have for the below the hook lifting devices. So temperature is really a good thing. We don't state it in ASME uh, unless the purchaser asks for it. The four primary things under ASME B30.20 uh, are the uh, manufacturer, the lifting capacity working load limit, and the uh, weight if it's over 100 pounds, and the serial number. Those are the four basic elements. Then if it's electrical in nature, we have to have the uh, voltage and cold amps. And we also, if it's a vacuum system, we have to have a PSI or vacuum uh, capability or capacity. Um, then under the new ASME BTH-1 lifting devices, design of lifting devices is a great document for engineers to look at in designing lifting devices. Uh, you can get down to a two to one design factor for a for a one lift operation. So they, what they're doing in that document, which is a, a brother to the ASME B30.20, that document on BTH-1 describes the engineering requirements, the service category and lift category and recommended design factors based on will it be like less than 10,000 or 20,000 lifts? Will it be over 20,000? Will it be 100,000 lifts? You'll get the idea that um, the engineer is getting instruction by the guideline in BTH-1 to make this equipment more robust, uh, build it out of equipment or uh, steel or other products that are more resistant to fatigue and can take the cycle loading that might be anticipated. For a single lift type lifting beam, they will uh, and do endorse the ability to get down to a lower design factor and give instruction and guidance accordingly. So the temperature question is not re is, uh, that you have is not required. But it it would be uh, uh, it is available from the manufacturer if we know that equipment's going to be used in elevated temperatures, and it should be uh, should be at least noted by the manufacturer on the product uh, um, guidebook and guideline for that material when it comes in with the operating instructions. There should be a section in there with a temperature restriction, both cold temperatures and elevated or hot temperatures. Great question. Um, another question from uh, Donna Dutcher, is it ever acceptable to conduct side loading? I have this as a normal engineer practice in my plant. I think the first thing you want to do is contact the manufacturer of the crane because they limit the number of engineered lifts on their crane, and, and that's under ASME B30.2 for overhead cranes. And then under general industry, OSHA is a 1910.179 uh, is overhead cranes. And there are very uh, strong limitations for what's regarded as engineered lifts by manufacturers. And there are limitations for side loading of overhead cranes. It's a, it's a terrible practice to get into. 
It causes rope damage for lifting. It causes bearing and truck wheel damage for overhead cranes. It certainly torques the drum and all the trolley system. Uh, there are times, places, and ways when a side pull uh, may be um, uh, have to occur, I guess. But it is, it, as a working practice, it's really something that's going to start deteriorating the crane's condition over time. And the only person really to get that information from is the manufacturer of that crane and, what the, and to follow their limitations for side pulling and for engineered lifts. I think, you know, I'm going to share something with the folks that have overhead cranes. What we would continue to help instruct our clients in is on every overhead crane, paint on the floor or demarcate on the floor the actual rectangle of which that crane hoist can work in. So if it's, uh, you're working in a crane bay that's 50 by 200, have a marking on the floor underneath that crane that parrots or mimics that 50 by 200 area. And the actual reach for that crane might be 44 by um, 190. And that's the box the crane can work in. We actually have a mark or paint the floor so that every time we have a load delivered to work in that bay, a package to be remachined or something to be handled, the center gravity of that load being placed there by a forklift or ancillary piece of equipment or truck needs to be inside of that footprint or box. That way the center gravity is within the reach of that crane and it's going to help reduce the opportunity for side loading of that crane. So put the load, put the CG of the load within that box that's underneath that crane dedicated to that this working footprint. Let everybody know if you deliver a load to us here in this bay, it's got to be within this footprint and will minimize or lower the opportunities for side loading. Um, let's see. Uh, our jobs require 100% tie-up over six feet. What are your thoughts on tying off the boom lattice or other components of the crane? Conrad Hernandez, good question. Um, I will tell you that um, when we uh, secure a, a, a tie-off to a hard point on the crane, obviously we have to follow the follow rest requirements in the ANSI standards for anchorage points, 5,000 pound minimum. And uh, the, those those uh, standards uh, for fall protection are in the uh, an ANSI series, uh, and I'll quote that to you in just a minute. I'm going to get a book handed to me. Fall protection, yep. Uh, and so, but the the, the guideline is um, you're going to you're going to need to be looking at ANSI uh, AS, and which is an ANSI ASSC combined document Z as in zebra three five nine, and the associated series with fall arrest and fall protection. So those are the standards that you need to refer to. I think the big thing that we got to watch for is, um, is our hard point, uh, can we do damage to it if we, uh, could you weld to a crane structure? And we opted not to do that. On our cranes inside and outside of our building, we, uh, we didn't want to go after engineering and decide could we weld hard anchor points to a crane. We wanted to use a genie lift or suitable, um, aerial work platform to access this different areas to get away from having to weld any anchorage points to our cranes to do service work, repair work, or inspection work. So one way is to try to try to have a secondary platform to work from and not have to tie off to the crane that you're having to inspect or perform service or maintenance work. Um, I will tell you that certain lacings on mobile cranes, and that was in your question here, lacings aren't going to aren't going to pass the 5000 pound muster. So you really have to evaluate the uh, anchorage points that you want to use on any any uh, system and any crane uh, to determine will it will it have a capacity and it may it likely will take an engineering review to give you that answer back. So I'd be very cautious about uh, where we tie off to if it's not a pre-engineered system. I won't go on record to say, yeah, you know, slap a, a sling onto a lacing on a lattice boom crane and then tie off to that for fall protection. But certainly, you, you, neither one of us would do that, and that's just not going to be a practice we can get into. So, but uh, I think you're going to need, if it's a Manitowoc, PNH, or Link Belt, a Terex, whoever makes that crane, Sammy um, or Sandy, to make sure that we we have a provision or allowance to use a certain uh, cord section or bridle section. Uh, or, or a potentially lacing component as a tie-off for fall rest, uh, we're going to need to get a manufacturer's approval on that. Having it in writing is always a good thing. 
we know it's been uh, reviewed and approved and get it documented and get it in writing and yes we can use that on a repeat basis if it's not don't do it I mean we just got to watch out we got to protect our people and got to know, know that we've got good anchor points um, good question on certified versus qualified. My documentation on training procedures supports qualifications, but how do we support a certified? And Raphael, that's a good question. Certification is different than qualification uh, only in this regard that certification is all about uh, strictly about testing and it proves a knowledge point either by written and by practical. A qualification, I think in some cases, um, it uh, qualification is a it's the, the weakness of qualification is that it probably hasn't been sanitized by a national accreditation process. So there therein lies the differences. Um, you, if it states nationally accredited certified, it, then a lot of subject matter experts have come together to identify what are the do job tasks and what are the elements leading to that certification requirement. If it's qualified, it will be really uh, potentially more suited to specific tasks and an ability to have knowledge, skill, and ability, and, a, and an ability to demonstrate the methods needed for that uh, process. So uh, qualification may be a little more local. It may be in-house qualification. It may be a manufacturer's qualification or third party. Certification will typically be uh, but it can be a, a private certification based on uh, steps and methods like ASNT, American Sight, and non-destructive testing, levels one, two, or three. But uh, it also be a national certification like CIC, CCO, and CCER. At the end of the day, I think employers need to verify qualifications or certifications of employees by performance. And so if a certified operator walks onto a job site and says, yes, I'm a, a large hydraulic crane, certified crane operator, that's all well and good, but he may have been trained and certified um, particularly on uh, one brand of crane. Uh, that that doesn't, may not exist at the job site. We need to get him up in, that, in the crane that's there and give him some seat time and then do a performance evaluation. Does he have the abilities and skills to manage the crane that we're now putting him into? The certification means he's got core knowledge and base knowledge of crane operations. His practical is challenged. Does he have depth perception? Does he have management skill ability to manage two functions or three functions simultaneously? And uh, can he follow signals? So the certifications verify some base core information but it may not have certified him for the specific crane that's on site. So always, whether certified or qualified, always lean on and land on performance of tasks to be performed at hand on site. That's really what we always want to get down to. And make sure it's all documented. Whatever you've got, make sure it's documented. I think we're going to need to close out for today. I do appreciate very much. I know we're well over time, but our questions and answers have helped take us over time. And I really appreciate everybody responding to our polls and our questions and answers. We will be uh, sending out a new notice in the future for our uh, continuing webinars downstream here, and we'll be responding to the subjects that you've identified as hot topics or things that you'd like to see particularly uh, addressed in future webinars. And thanks so much for uh, participating in ITI's webinar today. We look forward to uh, working with you in the future. And if you've got special requests or information uh, requests or any way I can help you, email me at mike, M-I-K-E, at I-T-I dot com. And we appreciate it and hope everybody has a good weekend and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks and take care. And thank you, everybody. And I just wanted to point out, Raphael, Conrad, and Dennis, we have your questions and we're going to respond to them and email them to you, okay? Uh, we just don't want to uh, take up anybody else's time anymore. So thank you, everybody, for joining and we'll be in touch. Thank you.